is uh, 1670 to 1789. This is an online professional uh, development seminar sponsored by America in Class from the National Humanities Center. My name is Wayne Pond. I will serve as your moderator uh, this evening. Uh, before we get underway, let me take please a moment or two to introduce you to the National Humanities Center. <coughs> the uh, center is located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. Uh, it is uh, the country's uh, exclusive and sole and independent institute for advanced study in all branches of the humanities. There are some great uh, photographs of uh, our wonderful building. Let me explain to you what uh, all of this is about. The center is a private, nonprofit uh, organization. Um, the main program is a fellowship program that convenes scholars from all over the United States as well as uh, from overseas. They come to the center for an academic year to do research and to write books on subjects in the humanities uh, that you are all familiar with, disciplines such as history, literature, language uh, studies, uh, philosophy, and criticism of the arts. Since the center opened in 1978, uh, 1,300 fellows, as they are called, have conducted research at the center and have uh, collectively produced about 1,300 books. Now those uh, pictures may lead you to think that the place is an ivory tower, and in fact it does look a little like one, um, but um, we, uh, the center's work seeks to connect with a very wide array of audiences beyond uh, those walls. And one of our primary constituencies is teachers, people like you. We do that online through seminars, such as the one you're about to participate in tonight, through anthologies of primary resources, through secondary resources, and through lessons. Um, the work of the center and the center's offerings uh, for teachers uh, available to you uh, at this website, americainclass.org. Um, okay, those are the uh, preliminary uh, remarks about the center itself. After this evening's programs, uh, you folks will be able to access a recording of the seminar plus the uh, PowerPoint uh, that uh, uh, our speaker will go through tonight. Uh, that will be at the Art and American Identity website, the same site from which you obtained the readings. You'll also find there an evaluation form. This is very important. We ask, please, that you take a few minutes uh, to complete it and send it to us. You can do that online. Uh, as I say, this is very important. The, uh, the uh, center staff pays uh, close attention to your comments and to what you have to say. Once we have received your evaluation, uh, you will receive a letter from the National Humanities Center documenting your participation in the seminar. In turn, you'll be able to uh, present that letter uh, to your uh, home base uh, to get whatever credit the seminar entitles you to. The seminar this evening has two sets of goals. Uh, one has to do with the new Common Core State Standards, under which many of you are teaching nowadays. The National Humanities Center is aligning its seminars with the major goal of the Common Core, namely to help ensure that all students are college and career ready uh, in literacy by the end of high school. To that end, both the standards uh, and the center promote close, attentive reading of challenging texts. Uh, moreover, both believe that uh, sophisticated literacy also includes the ability to read visual images. And so uh, tonight's uh, seminar advances the goals of the Common Core. Here's how our seminar this evening will work. Um, our uh, speaker from the University of Virginia, whom I will introduce to you in just a moment, will lecture on a series of uh, images and a couple of uh, <coughs> pardon me, pertinent quotations. 
She will merely highlight some, but she will focus on others, posing uh, discussion questions as we move through the seminar. You can respond to those questions, ask your own questions, or if you choose, make comments through the chat. Uh, simply place your cursor on your computer in the send box that is framed uh, in green. Type your questions, comments, or responses, and click the send button. Your message will appear in the chat box above. I will do my best to follow the chat box and bring your messages into, into the discussion as uh, we move along. Um, uh, so let's uh, get underway. Our second set of goals, uh, here's a quick description uh, as the uh, seminar's uh, intellectual takeaways of the things that we hope you'll take back to your students. Number one, to understand how different cultures came together, first as colonies, uh, then as an independent nation. Uh, to form a new identity that was distinctly American. And uh, the second uh, major goal is to learn how to pose uh, questions, to ask questions of uh, the art that you are going uh, to see. Uh, you post some uh, wonderful questions in the forum uh, that uh, uh, you all participated in. Uh, for example, in 1690, to what extent were the arts and material culture of the British Atlantic colonies American? And to what extent were they American by the end of the time period that we're looking at, uh, 1789? Um, and uh, a, another example there farther down the list, how did issues of gender shape uh, the evolution of national identity uh, at this time? To help us pose these questions uh, and to explore them, uh, I'm uh, just uh, immensely pleased to introduce you to uh, our uh, speaker this evening. She is Professor Mari McInnes of the University of Virginia. She is a professor of American art and material culture. Um, professor McInnes also serves as the Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at UVA. And there uh, on that uh, PowerPoint slide you will see uh, a brief description of some of the uh, uh, deep uh, and very sophisticated scholarly research and writing uh, that uh, Professor uh, McInnes has uh, produced. Uh, okay, now I need to find Professor McInnes' name on our list over here and pass to her uh, the baton. If you will bear with me for just a moment, please. There she is. Um, uh, Mari, good evening. Here I'm about to make you the presenter. It, uh, it is all yours. There you go. Excellent. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Um, I'm very much looking forward to spending the next hour um, and a bit with you, and we're going to work our way through a series of images and some text, and hopefully by the end of that time, those of you who uh, commented that you were not comfortable talking about images will hopefully be more comfortable in doing so. And we will also make some progress in thinking about these questions about whether or not the sort of artistic and cultural world of the British Atlantic colonies are really distinctly American by the time we get to, um, by the, time we get to um, the revolution. So I see a comment that says, um, difficult to hear me. Um, I've got my microphone all the way up. Um, I'm not really sure what else to do other than that. It's right up by my mouth. Those of you having trouble, would you please try adjusting your mic, your uh, speaker volume um, to make sure that um, it is set high? Um, and if you continue to have uh, difficulties, Please let us know. Uh, Maury, may I please, uh, let me just call uh, to the attention of our seminar participants a uh, logistical note here. Once you've joined the session, you can initiate the audio setup wizard at the top of the screen. Click on audio, then audio setup wizard, and then choose audio integrated VOIP. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that's complicated, but go up to audio, 
uh, audio setup wizard and then audio integrated. Uh, that may give you a couple of tools, folks, to uh, adjust the volume uh, that your uh, the, the 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 gain, as they call it, uh, on uh, Professor McInnes's uh, microphone. Uh, Mari, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I no, thought that no. was important. That is very important, and and hopefully this will uh, that will help people who are having difficulty hearing. Um, so what I want to do this evening is to both tell you some things, but more importantly, engage you by asking questions. And my goal is that you will contribute answers through the chat portion, which you will, as I pointed out in the introductory screen, that you will find at the bottom uh, right-hand side, and that you can uh, enter comments in answering questions that I pose to the group so that we can, uh, through the magic of Cisco technology, try to turn this into as much of a discussion as we can, even though that we're all sitting in front of computer screens hundreds of miles away from one another. Um, but before I do that, let me say a few words about um, the, the world that I teach in, and this is the world that we would call art history or material culture. And I know for some of you, this is not uh, an area where you may have done most of your own training uh, before becoming teachers, but it is something that increasingly you are being expected to pull into your classrooms. And so part of our goal tonight is to help you get more comfortable with teaching from images, but to do so, I think we need to talk about why images matter. Um, because it may not be immediately evident that a bunch of uh, paintings or a bunch of objects uh, can necessarily tell us that much about the past. And what I want to help convince you is indeed they do, and that in fact, for many of our students in our classrooms, sometimes they seem more accessible to them than a text from the past. And so images um, or things can end up being a really good way to engage your students um, by making connections with images or objects that they use and are part of their daily lives. So sometimes this can be a good way to get students uh, engaged in the material um, from the past that can seem to them as such a foreign land, such a distant place that has so little to do um, with who and what we are today. And one of the things that you may often have an opportunity to do is to pull together images with text. And so one of the things that I gave to you, and I don't know if everybody was able to look at the materials beforehand, but we have a really rare opportunity in the person of William Byrd to look at his own writing and then think about that how that relates to the way that he presented himself in a portrait that he had painted and that would have hung in his house and would have been this very public statement of who he was. Uh, in the 18th century, American colonists of the elite level, this, these are the people who had enough money to do so, were often commissioning portraits to be painted of themselves. And these portraits then became really public statements of who they were. They were trying to establish an identity for themselves through these portraits. And so for those of you who were able to read some of William Byrd's diary, um, I would be interested in hearing from you after reading the diary and looking at the image, what you think is missing, not evident, what were some of the things that surprised you as perhaps being different in these two presentations? We have an, um, Mari, if I may, we have an interesting question that just popped up that perhaps you could uh, uh, address quickly, parenthetically. Uh, what would be the cost of uh, a commission uh, such as the one that we're looking at now, uh, back in back in the day, so to speak? 
Yeah, it's an excellent question. And one of those questions that's always hard to get really good evidence on because while you can do economic conversions, they may not necessarily give you the sense of how much of somebody's sort of expendable income percentage-wise they were really spending. But this portrait was painted in England while the young um, American-born William Byrd was studying as a student back in England. And it's a very expensive commission. It was unusually fine even in the day of the 18th century um, in Virginia. And so, and in addition, and this relates to the other comment that is on the screen, portraits tended to be priced both by the quality of the artist, and here we're looking at a very highly trained uh, artist in working in London, but also by the size of the picture. And so the comment about an arm and a leg uh, relates to the fact that if you just had a portrait bust that showed only your head, that was cheaper than a portrait such as this. This would be called a three-quarter portrait. A full length would go all the way down to the toes. And this is probably, you know, an object that in today's money is easily $20,000, $25,000, something like that. I mean, it's a very expensive object, kind of along the lines, maybe even more than that, probably along the lines of a fine luxury car today. So um, if I can return to the question, did any of you read William Byrd's diaries and what were some of the things that um, surprised you? I like the uh, comment, a teacher's annual salary. Yeah, probably <laughs> about right uh, for one portrait. And this was one among many that hung in the Byrd mansion, not um, necessarily many of him, but most of his family he commissioned portraits of um, and many very close friends. Um, so he had many uh, cars or annual teacher of salaries uh, hanging in his class. Um, and he, maybe instead of starting with the diary, let's begin with the question of what impression of the man do you get from this image? Very serious, very uh, uh, worldly, uh, somebody who uh, takes not only himself seriously, but he expects the audience that he's gazing at from that portrait to take him seriously. Is that, is that a fair guess? Yes, yes. Um, so some of the comments that are coming in, that he was haughty. Haut, haughty, yeah. Right, <laughs> that he liked boats. So the ship really is a very, very important uh, aspect of this portrait and would have been seen in many portraits of the 18th century. Uh, one person noted associated with merchant ships, that is certainly part of it. Um, and another part of it is that in the 18th century, British colonists are connected with the rest of the British Empire by the ocean. And oceans and ships are so important to who they are and to their lives. All of the goods that they acquire come to them by ship from England. And quite often, many of them are sending what the way they're making their money, and that's certainly true for William Byrd, because he was a planter in Virginia and owned many, many slaves. And so the products that are being produced by that enslaved labor is being put on ships and shipped back to England uh, for the money that he will make to acquire the goods, such as this portrait, that then go in his house. And so ships the, uh, are such an important part of the 18th century world. The uh, the uh, suit of clothing that Mr. Bird is wearing in that uh, in that portrait is that aristocratic or military or a combination of the two? This it is. Um, what we might call aristocratic, but not what the British would think of as aristocratic. So William Byrd was um, by no means of the British aristocracy. He is an American colonial, but he's a very wealthy American colonial. So he is dressing much like a member of the British aristocracy or the gentry would dress. Um, but of course, he has no title associated with his name. 
Uh, it is a lavish uh, velvet, blue silk velvet jacket with mm -hmm. gold embroidery. Um, and that is about the most lavish dress um, that you could buy in the 18th century, short of being um, full royalty or gentry. Mm -hmm. um, others of you are commenting that he is um, many things about his demeanor, proud, establishing control, something of a distance. All of that is very true because part of what he's trying to impress you with is his demeanor and his importance and, very importantly, his social status. So to be in colonial America and own a portrait by a wealthy, uh, I'm sorry, by a very well-trained British artist speaks very highly of your own both education and cultural refinement. And much of what this portrait speaks to is his social status. Hmm. His hands look gentle, not worn. That's a very good comment. This is not a man who labors. Um, this is not a man who has ever had to do really a day of work. Um, so as another of you noted, not workers' clothing. So, you know, think it's always very important when you are looking at portraits, um, and this is true whether we're talking painted portraits from the past or even photographs taken today that somebody might present as, you know, kind of the image of themselves. Clothing is often one of the most important markers of a, a personal individual statement. Um, and so that's always a good place to start when you're trying mm -hmm. to get people to look at portraits and to think about what message is being sent. To, uh, to go back to that point you made about a, a laboring people or uh, people who don't work for a living with their hands, would that account for the sort of, um, what would be the right word, the delicacy of, of this man's hands, the way they're presented in, in, this, uh, in this picture? It is part that, and it is part the convention for um, representing refinement and elegance in mm -hmm. the 18th century. And if you looked across a series of English portraits, you would find many people represented in a similar pose, in a similar outfit, and looking very similarly. Um, in the same way that Today, um, you, many of you may have students in your classrooms who all want to wear the same name-branded merchandise um, to, be, uh, to make a statement about their own social status. This is similar in a way, um, just at a, a higher level. So can we turn now to the uh, question of the diaries? Um, for those of you who were able to read the diaries, did they give you an image of an individual that matches at all the in individual that you see on the screen? And if not, what were some of the things that come out of the diary um, that would give you a very different impression of this man were you to uh, get to meet him? Uh, Mari, I'll keep an eye on the chat box as our folks uh, contemplate that question. Uh, let me just uh, serve one of my functions here and tell you that it is 7.25. I'm supposed to give you a time check now and then just to make sure the train's running. Right, right. Hello? So, uh, so yes, I am not seeing uh, many comments in answer to that. So I will make a few comments and I will encourage you uh, very well read, okay, mm -hmm. Good. Um, an educated person, a very well educated colonial. Certainly not all colonials were as well educated as William Byrd. Um, William Byrd is rather an amazing 18th century individual in that he kept this series of private diaries mm -hmm. that he wrote in his own private code. Um, and it was only, I think, in the 20th century when uh, somebody was able to work out that code and translate them. So these were not diaries that were meant to be read by a public, um, but kept very much secret. And we find in those diaries 
um, a lot that relates very much to his life as a very wealthy, very well-educated, but also a very uh, patriarchal slave owner in the 18th century. Um, One of our folks asked the question, why did he keep them secret? Was that a, a widespread practice or is he the exception to the rule? Certainly from the surviving diaries we have, he is something of an exception. Um, there may well have been many, many more people who did that. Um, I think part of the reason why he did is he put very personal information in his diary, sometimes speaking very much about his own engagement in activities, uh, whether they were of a sexual nature or in many ways a physically violent nature in relationship to his um, treatment of slaves. And so there are quite often um, some real surprises in there that he speaks about very casually um, and sometimes in very surprising ways. Maury, do I, I probably regret asking this question, but is this the man who referred to what he called his private dance? Yeah. Uh, and uh, and uh, can we push the envelope a little further? I mean, what what do you know what that was all about? Oh, there's been so much speculation on uh, on that private dance. Um, one certainly assumes it is something of a uh, a sexual nature. Uh -huh. um, and what's what's tricky is extrapolating very um, shorthanded ways of referring to things to exactly what they mean. Um, but these diaries, his diaries are unusual. Regular diaries um, tend to give us a lot about daily life, uh, as one of the uh, participants has commented, maybe business dealings, people they interacted with. And what's so, uh, what we learn so much about from William Byrds is we see a lot about the power that a Virginia slave owner had. Um, over the people uh, who were working on his plantation. Um, and there is much to be learned uh, from reading the entirety of his diary. So as uh, Wayne is keeping me informed of time, um, I'm going to move on. Uh, hopefully that gives you some ways to think about talking about <laughs> portraits. Um, we'll have other opportunities later in the, sh uh, the, the slide presentation to do more with portraits. Um, a quick answer to a question there, when does the Hudson River School begin its influence? That is really something that doesn't begin until the 19th century. That's a sort of 1825 beginning, um, and landscape painting um, really stays dominant throughout the 19th century. So I want us to remember that while we're, most of what we're going to talk about today is about the British North American colonies, that indeed the, uh, what we now know of as the United States, of course, was not always only British. Um, in fact, there were many other imperial powers uh, reaching for land in North America, um, the two other two most important being Spain and France. And their colonial patterns of settlement and the issues they were interested in tended to be very different from the priority of British settlers. British settlers uh, were here for a variety of reasons, um, including making money um, and including religious freedom. Uh, when the French settled, there tended to not be near, nearly as many colonists coming here, but instead the French were very interested in engaging with the people already living here and converting them to Catholicism. And the image on the screen um, is certainly an excellent example of the kinds of images that the French brought to the New World as part of what was a much larger project in bringing religion to Native Americans. Um, and I know that most schools uh, today now spend a significant amount of time talking about Native American cultures and sometimes it's useful to think about the different approaches that the English settlers had towards Native Americans from the French settlers. So if you look at this image uh, created by uh, an individual, who, a Frenchman who was here, uh, who was trained both as an artist but was also 
um, a, a priest or a monk in the church and responsible for converting Indians. Uh, what sorts of messages do you get um, uh, in looking at this image about the story of French uh, uh, sort of missions in the New World? Uh, Mari, I'll just take a shot. The other worldly and the natural world, uh, this world and the next, is, is that uh, inappropriate? No, not at all. I mean, I think an image like this is meant to be in part educational. Mm -hmm. um, it is meant to uh, enable the church to educate Native Americans uh, about the Catholic religion. Mm -hmm. um, it is an allegory. One of the questions on the screen is, is it an allegory of France? Yes, the woman standing there is meant to be um, an allegorical figure of France. Um, and she is sort of handing an image of, um, of, of Christ uh, surrounded by saints um, and pointing to the heavens above. And this is all, could all be used um, as part of an educational program uh, for Native Americans. One of, our, one of our folks asks if this is an image that it was intended to soften the harsh realities of uh, uh, this rather what primitive, brutal life in the New World. Uh, um, a lot of stories about violent behavior, and here you have a picture that is, what, very benign. Exactly. I think that's an excellent comment. and a very useful one um, way that you could get your students in class putting this image up and asking them to think about, um, you know, whether this represents the way things were or whether this is indeed a propagandistic picture. And, mm. and indeed, I, I think it is that latter. It is part of um, selling a story um, of, of conversion. And another person comments that the image depicts the natives um, as as lesser beings, and there is absolutely no doubt that Europeans looked upon the American Indians they encounter here and believed them to be a term they often used in 18th century terms was savages. And part of the ways that they depicted savagery um, is um, in part kneeling in this image. That's a very important part. Um, and clothing is also really very important, the way that they depicted natives being dressed. The, uh, the, the clothing on the, on the female figure with her hand raised, is that particularly French? That is Mari? particularly French. You'll see the fleur de lis um, on her robes, her very elaborate velvet robes. And the fleur de lis, of course, is um, the, the sort of symbol of the king of France. Um, and, you know, image depicts hierarchy, um, the kneeling as being lesser. Those are all very important visual clues um, that you're all doing a great job of, of picking up on. Um, and if you'll notice, the Native American is now wrapped in velvet similar to the woman, the fleur de lis, but it is covering a body that is otherwise very lightly clothed. And what about so, the skin tone of the of the Native American, uh, Mari? One of our folks asked, was that um, uh, deliberately portrayed with a sort of light uh, skin tone? Uh, you know, that's a harder question to answer because we don't know um, mm -hmm. whether it was what what the message was behind that. I agree with you that it very much looks that way. It can also be in partly because French artists rarely had depicted people of different skin tones, and we quite often find artists struggling with how to represent differences in race and ethnicity as they're encountering new people in the new world. Is that a particular biblical uh, parable that's going on, the picture within the picture? It's mostly the, the kind of typical gathering of um, Christ and saints, both above and below. Mm -hmm. um, a, a rather common 17th century Christian, uh, particularly Catholic church image. 
Um, and so you'll see that in our kneeling native figure, um, it is as if she is giving him religion and with the gift of religion, then the mantle of France covers him and helps to civilize him. And one of the things that religion was thought to do in the 18th century from a European perspective was to bring civilization to Native Americans. Um, so we have a question about were the French kind to Native Americans, or do they right. treat them as savages? Uh, kind would not be a word um, that I would use. I think they were not uh, as brutal, perhaps, as the Spanish. Um, and yeah, so that's a very, very complex story uh, that certainly wouldn't answer any harm. They had a very different attitude from the British settlers. Um, the conflict with the British settlers was because there were so many British settlers coming in, um, and British settlers wanted their land. Mm. Uh, French settlers were not as, uh, there were not as many of them. So let us move on to our next images, because it'll keep us um, on the topic of Native Americans for a while. And, and let's think, continue to think about this question of how European artists depicted Native Americans. And these are two early portraits um, of two individuals, which is also extraordinarily unusual. We have very few images of individual uh, Native American Indians in the 18th century. So that alone is a, a rather remarkable thing. And they were created at a moment to uh, sort of mark a treaty that had been signed between uh, what was then the colony of Pennsylvania and the local tribe there. And as you look at these images, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on the choices that the artist has made in representing these individuals. Is that a native garb that these uh, two men are wearing, or would that be a European form of dress imposed on them? Uh, it probably is a bit of a mixture. Um, the fabric drape is probably a European convention, um, and that derives in many ways from a, an 18th century interest in the ancient Roman world where drapes, or togas as we might call them, were a common part. And so it's part of dressing them somewhat, but still very clearly indicating their lack of clothing. And their lack of clothing was often seen to be very much related to their savage status. Um, we also had a question in here about the pipe, and I'm really glad that one of you noticed that, because that speaks very much to the cultural exchange between Natives and Americans and tells the story of what, what is one of the most important parts of the 18th century story, which is tobacco. So, of course, tobacco as a plant is something that the British settlers learn about from the natives. Um, natives had been growing and smoking tobacco, tobacco for a very long time, but pretty quickly into that relationship, Natives quite often then begin trading for European made pipes, which they like very much. And so there's a real trade network around tobacco. Um, and tobacco is, of course, the economic story of the Chesapeake region uh, in the 18th century. One of our folks, Mari, says that uh, the painting strike. Uh, let me see, I think that's uh, Deborah, that is a, a, a woman that strikes her as uh, realistic. Uh, is, is it also fair to say that, it is, that these are images that are idealistic, um, uh, fitting into that whole, uh, what, notional conception of the, uh, of the noble savage? Is that uh, too far afield? No, I think that's not too far afield at all. And, and what is always impossible to know about images of people in the past 
um, is how closely these really are individualistic portraits. <laughs> Clearly, there is individualism there. They don't look the same as each other um, mm -hmm. in their faces, and yet if you look at their bodies, the age of face certainly doesn't seem to match the age of body. Um, there is probably a mix of both naturalism, um, that is depicting them with their individualistic features, as well as probably a bit of idealism as well going on. Okay, time, time check, uh, Mari. We are uh, approaching 20 minutes of eight. We've got about 50 minutes to go. Uh, just. Uh, 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 respectfully remind you of where we are in the sequence yep. of uh, images. Yep, so we are going to move on to our next image um, and able to talk about um, the representation of another of the largest and most important groups of people who are here. So part of the, the point that I hope to be able to make as we go through this tonight um, is to remind everybody that as you are working in colonial America and talking about colonial America, how important it is to think about the different groups of people who are living in these geographic locations and to think about the interactions between and among them. And what is challenging about this is we really only have the images from the white European settlers' perspective. It was not a time period when either African Americans or Native American Indians were really making images. Um, and so we don't have access to their voice and vision of things in the same way that we had access to lots of images from the European perspective. And so it's always really important that you get your students to think about um, whose, rep whose picture is it and what choices are they making and what messages are they sending. A couple, couple of comments here. Uh, there is subservience in this image and there is also a lot of wealth in that image on both figures. Uh, what, what about that? Right, so one of the things that this picture points to was a tradition that was quite common in the very wealthiest families of having for young children a, an enslaved individual who was essentially the playmate of that planter's child and who was often dressed in what they would have called in the 18th century livery. And so the slave is dressed in what would have been considered a sort of uniform that marked his enslavement, but livery was something only that um, certain house slaves or coachmen, quite often the people who drove the coaches, um, the people would also be dressed in livery. Um, the questions that, or the comments that you all are making about subservience is very, very important, and that is a clear message of this, right? The young man, the young boy, young white boy, is in a position of power and authority, standing, um, pointing in the direction of, um, of the town um, where his family is resident. Um, so the background is hinting towards, um, uh, uh, this is in Maryland, um, hinting towards uh, the, the setting in which the family owns land and the wealth accumulated to that family. Would anybody have associated the word racism with this image at the time it was painted? Racism is really a concept that enters later. Racism existed in the 18th century, but it was not yet really a concept um, and is one that will be uh, that will begin to develop at the end of the 18th century and into the 19th century. Uh, European Americans would have seen people of African descent as like they would have seen Indians as being distinctly different and subservient to them. Hmm. 
Another person makes the comment that childhood seems not to exist. Um, that is a very important point. Children were almost always dressed as little adults, both in paintings and in real life. And the concepts of childhood as we know them, this idea that you play and that life is really rather unstructured for a period of time and that there should be all this time for free and creative play, that's a sort of later idea that enters in more at the end of the 18th century, um, just starting to come in at the time when this image is painted. Yes, indeed. In fact, our folks are picking up on that on that very point. I can see in the uh, in in the chat box, uh, Mari. Yes. Um, so there's a comment here about other images, particularly of um, European royalty with African servants, um, and that is indeed very much a, a tradition that existed in Europe as well. It was not at all uncommon for members, particularly of the British gentry, to have a, um, a house servant uh, who uh, came from the Caribbean um, or from British North America, but usually they were from Caribbean, where the British had such large holdings. Um, and so important to remember in our look at using images from the colonial period to think about what limitations there might be. We've only looked at a few images, but these are very um, sort of typical of the kinds of images of it, that exist. So if we use these as an entry point into the colonial past, what is missing? What do we not have access to in images like this? One of our, uh, parenthetically, let me um, throw this into the mix, Mari. One of our folks says that it may not, these, uh, to go back to what you've been discussing, these images may not be uh, uh, taken in racist terms, but um, the question is, is there a moral dimension at work here in some sense? Yes, and, and, and that's what I think so difficult is what you all have to make decisions in your own classroom about whether you can create enough context and ask enough questions of these images, whether they actually let you get at what you need to get at, or are they so strong in, because they are images that speak sometimes in rather subconscious ways, whether you actually can't overcome some of that. And that may indeed be a decision um, in your individual classes, depending the age of your students and how far along they are in certain concepts of whether or not they're even useful. Fair enough. So we're going to move on to a very different kind of image, um, a really rare and singular image um, from the late 18th century um, that shows a remarkably different scene. And so let's just start by um, my asking you, you know, what surprises you about this image, given that almost everything that we've looked at before and most of what exists from the 18th century is from a European settler's point of view, what, what seems to be different about this picture? Well, these people are enjoying themselves, for one thing, and it looks surprisingly modern, doesn't it? And who's in the picture? It is a picture, are there any white people in this image? It's all black people. Yeah, it's a remarkable image um, that shows us only enslaved people of African descent. Um, and as you note, in a scene that seems to be of some joy, uh, what are some particular things that we know about African American culture um, that are being depicted here, and many of you are, are already getting towards this. Um, so there's a question about, is it a wedding? Uh -huh. There's a question about um, uh, whether it's, were, were we seeing any work here? Uh, we're certainly seeing people playing music, music as a form of entertainment. Um, certainly for many years, people thought this might be a wedding and a lot of people would refer to the custom that we know of from African-American culture called jumping the groom. Um, and for a long time, people thought this was an image of that, but as more scholarship has been done, and even if you just look 
closely um, at the visual evidence. That's not a broom he's holding. Um, it is instead a stick. And as we've learned more about African American uh, cultural traditions, in we're in South Carolina in this image. Um, in South Carolina, which tended to have a very strong West African tradition, particularly um, from the Ivory Coast, that what is going on is a particular form of participatory dance. And so you have musicians who are providing the music. One is playing a banjar, uh, what we would know today as a banjo, which is an African instrument. The other is playing a drum, which is also an African instrument. Um, and the male individual with the stick and the women with the claws are participating in what was a very communal sort of dance. And so it's an amazing image that focuses on African American culture solely. And the only white presence is the big house, as a number of you noted, in the background, but it is far away. Now that said, the person who created the image is white. Um, and so there is a white presence um, in the person who made the image. But this image can be very useful to talk about a wide variety of topics in African American culture, um, the importance of music, the importance of the ways in which African Americans were able in quarters to still have their own community and their own traditions, not always and not in all, all instances, but the ways in which they kept African-American community alive, African-American family alive, um, and you know, build a culture that became so central to the culture of the American South. And so these, this kind of image can be very useful in class. We have a question about whether um, this that those are liquor bottles. Hard to know. They are um, <laughs> ceramic containers that would have held liquid. Um, it would not be surprising if some of those liquids were alcoholic. No way to know. Another question, is this a self-trained artist? Yes, this is an amateur artist, um, a gentleman uh, planter who learned to draw and liked to draw and was particularly interested in slave um, culture. So yes, it does have that folk art feel or that self-trained artist feel. What about the two figures who are standing in front of the door on the right? They're the only ones that don't seem to be moving, as it were. Is right. there something they, special about them? Uh, yeah, I, you know, they're a big, they're a bit of a question mark, are they not? They seem the least engaged in the communal activity. Um, Yes, uh, interesting point that someone made reminding of Jacob Lawrence. You know, Jacob Lawrence, a very important African-American artist of the early 20th century, was um, always very interested in images from the past and history from the past, and is another great, is a really, really important artist that you can um, teach from. And he may well um, have known this image or other images like it, um, and certainly influenced by them. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to our next deck. Those are um, just a number of examples of the kinds of images from the colonial period that you might be able to use to talk about the different cultures that came together in America. And, you know, in, in 1670, Pretty much everybody is pretty much what they were, where they came from, British, Native American, African, um, uh, French, Spanish, you can Dutch, you can keep going on. But there is a process um, that happens as people live here over, over generations and interact with one another that ultimately come together to form um, American culture. So we're going to move now to thinking about things. Um, so these are less images and more things. Um, and stuff is um, a, a really interesting way to try to get your students engaged with the past, and particularly in American history, because we find in the colonial period that Americans, or you know, American colonists become obsessed 
with stuff. And given our own sort of continuing fascination with things, and all you have to do is, you know, pay attention to the uh, news coverage of Black Friday, um, we're still rather obsessed with things. And sometimes you can start these conversations with students in thinking about things that they desire or things that are really important to them to have as an entry point into the 18th century. But it is in the 18th century when this thing we call the consumer revolution began. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if any of you have any idea what the consumer revolution was um, or what you think that phrase might mean. Um, so if you have any ideas, go ahead and type that in. In, while we're contemplating that, uh, uh, Mari, let me, uh, if I may, read uh, just a couple of uh, passages here from, this is Benjamin Franklin, is it not? Yes, this is uh, we, we have an English. Fun and fabulous. Right. <laughs> and his many autobiographies. We have an English proverb that says, he that would thrive must ask his wife. It was lucky for me that I had one as much disposed to industry and frugality as myself. She assisted me cheerfully in my business, folding and stitching pamphlets, tending shop, purchasing old linen, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We kept no idle servants. Our table was plain and simple, furniture of the cheapest. For instance, my breakfast was a long time bread and milk, no tea, and I ate it out of a two-penny earthen porringer with a, a pewter spoon. I mean, talk about a setup for what's about to become a reversal in his life. Are we, are we on the right track there? You are exactly on the right track. He's, <laughs> well, here's Franklin's wit at work, as well as what you, I suppose, could call historical truth. That's right. And, you know, and then he goes on to say, but Mark, how luxury will enter family. Right. And he goes on to talk about his pewter, his earthen porringer and pewter spoon being replaced with a china bowl and a spoon of silver. Um, <laughs> and he's very important, he's very careful to point out that it was his wife who made this decision, right? And that she thought if the neighbors were using a silver spoon and a china bowl, that he should have one as well. Um, and in many ways, this is the process of the 18th century. And it is what historians now call the consumer revolution. And some of you have mentioned, well, war is being produced. And that is certainly part of it. No doubt about it, um, and it is certainly true that we suddenly have an, a, a sort of industrial revolution in England that allows for the production of all of these things, and yet there are also other reasons. The question is, why would you, buy, why would you want all of this stuff? And in many ways, it goes back to what we saw in that very first portrait, and that was the concern over social status. And the reason why social status mattered so much in a place like America was because kind of everybody was new there and nobody really knew each other. It was very different from a medieval world where everybody lived in the same village and everybody knew the same 100 people and everybody's rank and status was clearly known and understood. In America, you had a very mobile world, and you marked your social status, increasingly so in the 18th century, by the stuff you bought. And just they uh, very important markers of who you were. Mari, to pick just one of those dates, say 1784, 85, and then Franklin mentions several hundred pounds in value. What what would that translate to? In, in our modern monetary system, several hundred pounds. Yeah, that's probably a few thousand dollars. Uh, so it's not, it's not insignificant. It's not insignificant. It's not at all insignificant, especially to somebody who was then, you know, middle class. Uh -huh. And what is so different in the 18th century is this interest in stuff, which, the roy which royalty and nobility had always had, comes down to the middle class and it really becomes a defining part of the middle class. Um, we have a comment 
um, on the screen that's very important about for the direction we'll be going with this conversation about the consumer revolution. And it really is a story of globalization. We all talk about globalization today as if it's a new phenomenon. It is not at all a new phenomenon. It has been with us a very long time. And as Martha is pointing out to us, coffee, chocolate, calico, fabric, sugar, tea, all of these are world markets, global uh, commodities that are being uh, exchanged and transported around the world. And the consumer revolution is really the first moment um, of globalization. And the things that we see, um, see Franklin mentioning his silver spoon, his china bowl, it's called a china bowl because it comes from China and makes its way to England and then gets retransported. Uh, to America. And if we continue on um, with Franklin, um, and we won't read this whole thing, but important things to look at are is this increasing accumulation of more and more stuff. And one of the most important places where stuff shows up is around the ritual of drinking tea. So it was tea in the 18th century that was the center of everybody's lives. What is the center of our social world today? What beverage would you say is the most important today? Coffee, beer, that's a good one. Yeah, probably not one you can really use with your students. <laughs> uh, but I think you can talk to them about coffee, given that no matter where you are in America, you probably have a um, Starbucks not too far away and the amount of money that is spent um, in American culture today on coffee is really kind of similar to uh, the obsession for tea in the 18th century. There was a headline this morning on the news that said that Starbucks is now selling a particular kind of coffee for seven dollars a cup and forty dollars a pound. I'm not making this up. Ah, right, right. So think about that expense. What is Different for us today is our rituals are not nearly as elaborated as theirs were and do not involve quite the same accumulation of things that allow you to show everybody that you know how to drink coffee properly. <laughs> right? Our rituals are more in the sort of the ordering process. You know, I want a half chai, half soy, you know, half tea, foam off the top, you know, all those kinds of crazy things that we all have fun of. Um, that's our ritual. But their ritual in the 18th century involved the accumulation of objects and a very precise social ritual. And so you showed your class status by being able to properly perform the rituals of drinking tea. Um, and it was a very elaborate ritual that involved really amazing stuff. Um, so can you think of ways, so in my discussion question here for the teapot, which was always the, the kind of the, the, the pinnacle of the stuff that you owned around drinking tea, um, you know, what is the importance of stuff? Um, and I mentioned one that stuff can be about social status. What are some of the other reasons why it's important to think about stuff? What does stuff say about us? While you're contemplating that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mari, let me uh, remind you, we've just passed the 8 o'clock uh, moment. We've got about a half hour to go. Uh, we don't have to end exactly at 8.30, but uh, if need be, we can uh, linger for a few moments, but I just wanted to give you that time check. Right. Wealth, yep. Wealth is, wealth is always a very important, and yet they don't always necessarily correlate, do they? Sometimes people will choose to buy, a, you know, an object that may be rather singular to them, um, a very... Uh, unusual, uh, you know, I, I know I had was surprised the first time that I went uh, to the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico and passed um, a number of Mayan villages where 
you know, they were still living in rather traditional architecture, which to my American eye did not seem very substantial, and yet they had a satellite dish and a big television. Um, so it doesn't necessarily always equate to wealth, does it? Mm -hmm. um, so stuff can be used to reflect aspiration. I think that's very important. Um, for social bonding, that's what I think your comments about guests, um, I think that's a very important aspect of all of this. It's part of mm -hmm. forming community quite often. Um, Not just for, social status, but sociability. That's um, right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. And you can try to get your students to think about ways in which objects today um, do the same kinds of things. Um, while it wouldn't be appropriate in a K-12 classroom, um, one of my students here at the University of Virginia wrote a really amazing paper on the red solo cup. I don't know if you know what these are, but these are these red plastic cups. Because at the University of Virginia, they all use red solo cups at parties to drink their beer out. And so he wrote an amazing paper about the social rituals around the red solo cup. And everybody, you know, whether it's, the, you know, the disposable coffee cups that you get from Starbucks or the more permanent, uh, you know, uh, thermoses that we carry around for our coffee, there are lots of ways that, that you can um, get people to think about the objects that they have, the clothes that they wear, the statements they choose to make about themselves through stuff. And that's usually what it is. You're usually making a statement to somebody else mm -hmm. um, uh, about these things. Just parenthetically, Maury, there's, uh, this, it occurs to me uh, at the beginning of Henry James's novel, The Portrait of a Lady, there's a marvelous scene where he makes the case for uh, the high watermark of civilization is afternoon high English tea in the afternoon. Yes. And if you haven't read it, folks, uh, let me urge you to check that uh, passage out. Uh, it really brings together a lot of the imagery and substance that uh, Professor McInnes has been describing here. And so we won't stay here very long because I've kind of already made this point, but um, the objects from the past can also be a very good way to help students remember um, the really global world that this place has been for a very long time and the trade and circulation of goods and ideas. So this image that we're looking at on the screen, which is a covered punch bowl, a punch bowl was again another item of sociability. You would place into it an alcoholic punch um, that was then in the center of the table and cups would be dipped into it. So people were sort of drinking from this communal bowl. Um, this bowl made in China for a market in Sweden. So made by Chinese ceramicists, painted by Chinese ceramicists, but with European imagery because they were thinking about the European market for a European beverage, the punch bowl, that then ultimately makes its way uh, to America as well. Um, and so items like this speak to um, a global trade in uh, mm. goods that are where you have goods responding to far off markets and trying to adapt to those markets, but people desiring exotic goods from other lands. and. Um, that really hasn't changed much at all. We are still very much um, doing that. Um, things can get to us a lot faster, um, and some of those goods are desirable by us now because they're cheap, not because they're luxury goods, but in many ways the, um, the impulse is the same. Are you telling us that outsourcing is uh, like globalism, nothing new? That's right, nothing new. It's been going on for a very long time. So some of the other things, some of the other kinds of topics and ways that I think images from the past can be very useful uh, when you're working with your students is to get them to think about um, kind of issues and topics that might be um, very uh, pertinent to them, that might be very accessible to them, the kinds of things um, that 
they might easily think about. And to be able to talk about um, the ways that things have changed, for example. So you can pull up portraits of women um, and actually in some ways they might be useful in contrast to portraits of men and think about the different ways that men and women are portrayed. Um, women are very rarely represented with items of learning. Women are very rarely represented in relationship to work in the 18th century because, of course, they weren't doing um, the same kind, they weren't educated in the same ways and weren't able to do the same kind of work as men. And so they were quite often represented either with children, um, with luxury items, with fruit that might represent their fecundity, their ability to bear children, um, and things like that. There are also a large selection of lovely images um, of children that quite often students are very interested in talking about. And so we have on the screen um, a really lovely image of a young Virginia girl um, by a British trained painter called John Wollaston. Um, that might be a very good way to help children um, in your classrooms to, to connect with the idea of being a child in the 18th century. Um, so somebody has mentioned clothing and toys um, and think about like how that's different, right? Yeah, very different from today's uh, common child. Look at how the young girl is dressed. Does she mm -hmm. look like a young girl? Is she dressed like a young girl? Um, she really dressed much like a, a just small version of an adult. Yeah, this goes to your point about miniature adults. Right, very much so. Uh, too much decolletage, exactly. I mean, she's really being shown there as if she were um, an adult, right? And yet she is a young child. But she is shown with a doll. Um, and so being able to point also to the ways in which things um, are, in, are constant um, over time can be very useful as well. The other kind of stuff um, that is really plentiful and can be very useful from the 18th century is furniture. Um, and the kinds of things that we learn from furniture are the different kinds of pieces of furniture that start being made in the 18th century that speak to very different ways of living, right? So what we have in front of us is a bureau table. It was essentially kind of a dressing table that would have a mirror on top of it, and in the drawer you would pull it out, and it would have um, – the things of your, what they would have called in the 18th century, your toilet, the things of getting yourself ready, your makeup, your, um, it, it's actually rather gross, but part of your makeup usually was wax that you would put in your scars that you might have from having had smallpox um, or that you might have from other, you know, nasty diseases. Um, that you would have had in the 18th century. So they quite often put wax in their scars and then put makeup on their faces, um, dressed their, if they're women, dressed their hair up, powdered their hair um, to make it look like a wig. And remember that these are not people who, who bathe with any sort of regularity. If they pay bathed once or twice a year, um, it was really quite amazing. They didn't consider bathing healthy. They considered that spreading disease. Um, but this is all starting in the 18th century when they're beginning to make themselves up, when they're beginning to change that outward appearance for all these other things we've been talking about, status um, and so forth. So the center compartment, there's a question on the scene, screen, is so that you could fit your knees in um, and sit at that bureau in order to um, make yourself up. 
um, secret diaries. Yes, you might store your secret diaries in one of these locked drawers. And you also see in a thing like a bureau a lot of drawers because you suddenly have a lot more clothes in the 18th century than you did um, in the 17th century. So as you know, as this time is marching on and we're getting closer to the time of the American Revolution, Americans just have a lot more stuff um, of all kinds, from clothes to silver to china to things. And their life is much more defined by things. And they really desire things um, and so forth. And we're going to come back to that point in just a minute. Um, I want to spend just a couple of minutes on this picture, which is really a remarkable picture made not in the American colonies, but um, in Suriname, um, so down on the northern coast of South America, but very much part of the colonial world, and by an artist who spent a lot of time in America as well. Um, and we've been talking about kind of refinement and social status and class. And I want you to look at this image and see if that's the impression that you get. Is this an image that speaks to a refined um, and genteel lifestyle like all these portraits have been saying um, and like all these objects have been hinting at? One of our people says debauchery. Is, exactly. is that, so that going too far? The guy puking in the background, bar fights and sailors, no refinement here. Um, images of disorder, really important to remember that all those other images that show the refinement of 18th century life is the, the image of themselves they're trying to represent, but of course it may not be the reality. 18th century life was actually pretty rough and tumble. Uh, people drank a lot. Uh, people had very different ideas of what was um, sort of appropriate behavior um, in many arenas. Um, and you can see it here from the puking, the heavy drinking. This is an all-male place, um, mm. and this is not a place where women existed, right? And there was definitely very different behavior uh, when men were alone together than when women were in their company. And is, that a, that, is, is that a pickpocket at work in the middle of the picture? Or? No, he's puking into his pocket. Ah, okay. <laughs> All right. Right. So again, depending on the age of your students, maybe not the best image to use. Um, but yes, there's indefinitely comic intent here. Um, but it also speaks to something of a reality. I mean, the, it, that 18th century life was a lot more um, sort of down and dirty than um, the other kinds of images tended to represent. Um, so it's meant to be comedic, it's meant to be funny, but it also speaks to um, a certain reality and can be a good counter to the sort of stuffy image of refinement that seems to come from a lot of the other images. All right, so we're going to return to our story of stuff because it plays such an important role in the lead up to the American Revolution. And this is something that many of us overlook because we tend to talk about the coming of the American Revolution as entirely being about a number of principles, whether it is the no taxation without representation, um, whether it is the principles of moving away from monarchy and establishing a government of representational democracy. Um, and it can be easy to get caught up in all of that. But the first real conflict between the British colonists and Great Britain is really over things. It is about stuff. So the complaints about the Stamp Act are complaints about taxation of the thing that American colonists wanted to buy, right? And so all of the brouhaha in 65 um, around repealing the Stamp Act is trying to end taxation of the things they really liked, the fabric they were buying, the furniture and silver they might have been importing, 
uh, the wide variety of goods that they are buying from England. This this would give new meaning and importance to the whole customs house uh, phenomenon. Is is that correct? Exactly. That's exactly right. The customs house was a real in any city a real sort of stamp of British imperial authority. In the same way that a governor's palace or so forth, these real markers in the 18th century landscape that said, you know, you are part of the British Empire and you owe your loyalty to us. And much of that loyalty uh, increasingly in the 18th century was about trying to get tax revenues from the British North American colony because of the expenses of what we would call the French and Indian Wars what the British would call the Seven Years' War. So they were trying to help pay for protecting the colonies. But British colonists did not like that. The American colonists did not like that. Um, and so there are two moments of um, real agitation in the Ameri North American colonies around ending this taxation of things. And it begins in 1765, wanting to repeal the Stamp Act. And in city after city in America, there are agreements, what they call non-importation agreements. And what do you think those might have been? Well, those were kind of agreements not to buy goods that were being taxed, goods from Britain that were being taxed. Can you think of any parallels today? Can you think of any sort of consumer movement today that might be similar to the non-importation agreement? Um, because these are really tendencies that we still um, have. Don't get it made in China, right? So there are a lot of people who will choose not to buy a product if it's made in China, right? Um, or people who will want to buy fair trade coffee, right? So they're making a consumer statement. Child labor products, another really good example. So as you're teaching the American Revolution and teaching uh, the, you know, the Stamp Act crisis and then later the tax, the tea tax um, crisis, these are great ways to get your students to think about that kind of activism where a group of people come together and around consumer issues, try to make, to try to change policy, right? Or try to change imagery. And in the 18th century, um, these kinds of images, they were, they were quickly made um, prints that were sold cheaply, but that could sort of be used to talk about an issue. So quite often these would be passed around a tavern and everybody would look about them and talk about them. And here we are seeing uh, the end, the repeal of the Stamp Act because they were successful in their non-importation agreements. They were able to get the taxes removed. But of course, we all know that uh, they were put back on shortly thereafter. And there was another set of sort of non-importation agreements. Um, and we eventually find ourselves um, moving more towards the revolution. So question, would they be posted up on a wall or just passed around? Quite often they were posted. They would be posted in taverns. They would be posted in window shops. Um, they were really very much a way to spread political discussion, to spread those kinds of conversations. Um, and they would be talked about in taverns, in public places, um, both the print as well as the politics behind them. Were, are those uh, clergymen or uh, judicial uh, figures on the right-hand side of the image? So on the right-hand side of the image, I think they are judicial figures. Near the front of the line, I think they are dressed as both as clergymen and as individual sort of citizens. Um, and so you have what would be a traditional looking funeral um, but instead here it is the uh, Stamp Act that is being um, repealed, that is being put, laid to rest um, and having a funeral. And what's really amazing about both the Stamp Act crisis um, and the Townsend Act um, and the opposition to the Townsend Act that will follow in 1770 
is that you suddenly had colonies who previously had little to do with one another seeing eye to eye on an issue. So, you know, South Carolina and Massachusetts couldn't have been much more different from one another in, say, 1764, but they find themselves in 1765 agreeing on this issue of the Stamp Act. And they find themselves agreeing in 1770 on the Townsend Act. And as we move closer to the revolution, one of the things that they have in common, there are others, of course, but a really important one um, is their relationship to stuff and how important stuff is to them um, and how they come together in political action um, around stuff, around the goods of the consumer revolution. Um, and so this idea that all the colonies have to come together and agree on things um, in order to be politically successful is such an important part of the story of the revolution. Had any of those colonies fallen off and not been part of it, um, it would have been, you know, the, the odds of success would have diminished significantly. Um, so these are different ways that you can add to your teachings of the coming of the revolution and ways in which American colonists that have such different lives, you know, a South Carolina planter and a Massachusetts merchant have little, would barely recognize themselves as part of the same country in say 1773 and yet somehow in 1776 they become part of the same country. And part of this is through this process in the 1760s and into the 1770s of working together on political issues, and these happen to be largely around stuff. Uh, the question of where is Georgia, I don't know. I don't know why it didn't make it into this image that was widely circulated in the voting period. Um, they seem to be mostly the uh, coastal um, colonies, but I don't see Pennsylvania there either. So clearly uh, something's missing there in, in this artist's rendition. Uh, so we're nearing the time of our, our 8.30 hour. I always like to give a few minutes at the end. Um, we we are questions. We are uh, Mari. If if I may, would you kindly pass the baton back to me, and uh, you you'll still be able to speak to our group. But uh, as we do that, I can run through some uh, wrap up material. Sure. And uh, can you tell me how to do that? I'm not sure. Okay, how you what? Okay, I think I think you just succeeded in doing it. I, I think Karen <laughs> did it for us. <laughs> yeah, okay, Karen, thank you very much. Um, okay, well, um, as you're contemplating uh, final thoughts here, uh, both Professor McInnes and our uh, uh, wonderful group of participants tonight, you folks have just been splendid with these uh, excellent remarks and, and comments. Uh, Maury, I, I salute you for not only maintaining a wonderful integrity of the presentation, but keeping your eye, managing to Keep your eye on the um, on the chat box at the same time. Uh, before we wrap things uh, up, let me uh, uh, again ask you to think about uh, uh, final thoughts. Uh, we we hope that we have answered your questions. Um, the site will remain up for. Um, gosh, I'm not sure exactly what it is. Karen, are you able to weigh in on that and tell us how long the site will be there so that people can? Uh, uh, put uh, material on the forum. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm 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 not sure that she can. Um, but we encourage you to use the forum. Uh, there we go. I'm sorry. It will be up until December the 20th uh, to continue the discussion. Uh, we encourage you to share fresh approaches uh, and questions uh, about uh, the material that you've seen uh, tonight. Our uh, next seminar, uh, Winslow Homer's Civil War Art, from 7 to 8.30 p.m. on Tuesday, the 4th of December. Uh, Professor Kirk Savage uh, of the University of Pittsburgh will conduct that seminar. Uh, we uh, want to point out to you to uh, uh, submit your evaluations. 
Uh, again, that is very important to us. Uh, and now, uh, Maury, uh, let me turn to you. Uh, any uh, final thoughts here as, uh, as you conclude our, our, our seminar? Um, well, I'm trying to look in uh, at, at the comments. I don't think I see uh, any other major questions, but um, I have in the past when if, if you have questions that come up, you can put them into the forum um, and they will get, I will get that information and I will be glad to answer your questions and I'm happy to do so Great. individually. Right. So please know that any questions you have, um, as long as the site is active, feel free to send my way and, and I will get back in touch with you. Okay, oh, and here uh, we're, we're extending uh, even farther uh, into the future. The uh, forum will be live until December the 30th, ladies and gentlemen, not, not the 20th. And uh, the folks at the Humanity Center will be uh, monitoring uh, that. Well, um, we uh, thank you for your uh, wonderful participation. Uh, Professor McInnes, thank you so much for this uh, splendid talk that you uh, have given us. How's the weather in Charlottesville tonight? Uh, crisp and clear and beautiful. Some, some of our Los Angeles people checked in early with greetings from drizzly Los Angeles, they said. So, all right. Well, uh, folks, one final thought. Please check the uh, schedule of seminars for the spring of 2013. And, and one more time, let me remind you to submit your evaluations. Thank you so much for your participation tonight. And on behalf of uh, Professor McKennis uh, and the National Humanities Center, uh, we, we bid you good evening.